Hey everyone, welcome to the Parts Girl podcast. I'm super excited to be interviewing Ron today. Welcome, Ron. Hey, Kaylee, how's it going? Thank you for having me. Yeah, absolutely. I'm I'm so glad to have you and get to know you because there's a lot of things I realized I didn't know about you and I'm excited to get into that. (laughs) But for anyone that doesn't know who you are, just do a quick intro, you know, who you work with, you know, who you are. Sure. So Ron Marvo here. How's everybody doing? Thank you for listening. Uh, I've been in the automotive space since 2017. I am a car encyclopedia since I'm a kid. Grew up with a father who drag raced motorcycles, had two Audi mechanics uh, that I grew up with in my family. Uh, I'm a former Golden Glove State Champion in the state of New Jersey, former USA certified boxing coach, still chasing a pro career in boxing. And currently, I have the honor and privilege of working directly hand in hand with Sandy Sarami, none other than the solutionist, who's my right hand guy. Uh, we get to we get to do this is something we constantly say. And between the two of us, we uh, do business development training for B two B and B two C sellers. Uh, we do focus primarily in the automotive space because we both always say everything's a car deal, and we both have our automotive background. And then uh, we also do recruiting for automotive partners and automotive dealerships across the country. Uh, and we find technician candidates all the way up to FODs, GMs, managing partners, and uh, find alignment really in opportunities for individuals and also the dealer clients and automotive partners that we recruit for. So that's pretty much in general uh, uh, what we do. And I've been Good. in this space for about six years now. That's amazing. Six years. Okay. And then you guys added, uh, what was it, 50 hire, new hires in the last year? Yeah, yeah, we've 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 gotten fifty people opportunities within the automotive industry in the last year and about three months, four months. So fifty placements across the country from automotive B two B to dealerships nationwide, and it's really really exciting for me because I I get to pre interview most of our candidates and uh, getting to help people find alignment and opportunity and helping the dealer find that individual that they really need or the automotive partner out there. Uh, is something I really take pride in. Oh, yeah. I feel like that would be a really cool part of your job is to really like get to know people and, and fit them in the right place so that they can have fulfillment in their life. So very cool. Yeah, well, let, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Let's talk about um, your uh, your guys's course, because that's I remember when I when we met at the Business Bourbon Cigars and we talked about it and I didn't realize you guys did B2B too because I think it's so important that salespeople have continuous training. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. Like anyone, we all need to we all need to continue to learn. So walk me through what that looks like. What cuz I feel like we all have this idea of what a course is or what training looks like, but I think yeah, for yeah. everyone it's a little bit different. So what does it look like for you guys? So right now, Sandy and I are in the middle of building out our actual virtual version of the academy and the course, but it is the seven pillars of killer business development. And really what it entails is a amalgamation of sales, branding, marketing, and ultimately mindset. Really, you know, how to become that trusted advisor in your marketplace. So, you know, when somebody has a question or are at what we call high noon, ready to make a purchase decision, it's our phone that rings, our email inbox that dings because we've done everything up to this point to create that dynamic personal brand in the marketplace. So they view us as that trusted advisor or resource in the market. Or maybe they spoke to us, put in a lead in the past, what have you. We answered their questions. They weren't at high noon, ready to buy just yet, but. Uh, a lot of times, you know, we get so wrapped up in the closing element of sales and we forget about the relationship element. So a lot of what the self and pillars really, really at the foundation is, and our goal and our mission is literally this, it's to help you, the client, gather and help us gather and share all the information that we need to help you, the client, make the best decision possible for you. So it's a qualifying uh, process. It's you know asking smart, relevant questions, turning everyday conversations into client opportunities, learning how to leverage social media to build a fat pipeline of prospects, uh, not by pitching, but by educating, entertaining, speaking directly to your uh, client's pain points and desired end results. You know, I use something called PFHD squared. Uh, which I got from Sabri, Sabri Subi, who is the CEO of King Kong Marketing and the author of Sell Like Crazy, which is 
uh, pains, fears, hopes, dreams, and desires. And all of us land somewhere in that world uh, when making a decision. We're either trying to move away from pain and fear or trying to move towards an equal or greater gain, hopes, dreams, desires, or you know, positive outcomes. So a lot of the Seven Pillars course is based around uh, that specifically, uh, long-term lifetime value, playing the long game, not having a transactional mindset, but a relationship mindset. And we've completely eliminated the word customer from our dictionary. And we teach uh, something that we've learned from Jay Abraham, which is the definition of customer and cl versus client. And in the Webster's Dictionary definition of customer, it is someone who purchases a commodity or service. So it is mm -hmm. a transactional mindset. Compared yeah. to a client, which literally the Webster's Dictionary definition of client is someone who is under the protection of another, which denotes yeah. a relationship. Yeah. So when you uh, act and do everything mindset wise, everything that you do towards, you know, helping facilitate a positive outcome for your client, you know, we really want to have the mindset of relationship versus transactional and, and seven pillars is, is what we use to guide selling pros B2B and B2C uh, into getting into that relationship mindset, leveraging their opportunities, and then being able to close more deals ultimately because they've created shared outcomes with their clients. And by the time they get to the negotiation, it's less of a negotiation, more of a collaboration because you've already identified what's most important to your client. So hopefully that gives you a, a, a brief, but a little bit more of an understanding of what the seven pillars of killer business development truly is. It does. And I have so many questions. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Laying down all my, I, it's so funny when I'm interviewing, I just scribble down words. I'm like, okay, I got to go back hey, to that. Even when I'm being interviewed, I'm here taking down notes. So I get it. <laughs> I don't even know if they're notes, it's scribbles. <laughs> but uh -huh. They're just scribbling all over. As long over as they're legible to you, Kaylee, that's it. That's all that matters. That's true. Um, okay. So you talked about the, the closing and the, I feel like that happens a lot in the automotive space is like they, they, they're just drilled with that natural, like always be closing. And yeah. it sounds like you guys have developed something to move away from that because that's not, even though you're selling a vehicle or you're selling a service to a customer, it's essentially needs to be looked at. These people or consumers need to look at as a client is what you're saying. Yes. So imagine for a second, you know, your consumer as well. And so am I, what's your number one fear, Kaylee, when you go out to buy something that you're going to make a mistake? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I want to make the right decision. Right. I like want to do research on it. <laughs> yeah. So a lot of times, and especially today and today, if we're speaking specifically automotive, we are on parts edge podcast, you know, we have people that are inquiring via phone, email and walk in primarily nowadays, your digital storefront is really where they're starting their search, right? Clients mm -hmm. are looking at four or more brands at one specific time. And usually by the time that they're walking into your showroom, it's because they've narrowed down that, Hey, your brand and your vehicle, and maybe your dealership is the right place to buy and could be the right car. And yeah. that's up to us ultimately to find out, well, what is driving that decision saying, hey, uh, you know, in Audi A4, I'll use Audi because I worked for Audi most of my uh, professional automotive career. You know, an A4 is something I'm looking at. I'm comparing it to the C300 and the 3 Series. I'm really not sure what I'm interested in at this time, but I definitely want to come check it out. At that moment, I'm, I'm going right into fact-finding mode of what, what did you really like about uh, you know, the BMW or Mercedes, if you've seen it at this point, or what research have you done compared to the Audi? What do you currently have in your current vehicle? You know, and going through that qualifying process, essentially, but then also at the same time, while they're giving me that information, when I go to do my walk around presentation, I'm catering my walk around based on what's most important to them in that next vehicle. So, you know, I'm showing them a feature explaining what it does and then ultimately tying it back to have you ever been in this type of situation it sounds like you have this is something that's most important to you in your search this is why it'll really help you in the a4 or the 3 series or or the c300 whatever you might be selling getting down and identifying the nitty-gritty of why your client is walking in the showroom or sending in a phone lead or an email lead is is part of is part of this is part of the seven pillars at heart and and really once you get uh, your clients to understand you're there to help them make the best decision possible for them. 
and they're not going to make a mistake and they can feel that level of trust very quickly. By the time we get to closing, which you mentioned ABC, and I'm so glad you did always be closing, right? It's not always be closing. That's such a pressuring thing for people, especially people nowadays who want an experience. They want to hear uh, somebody think in, that's thinking along the lines of, even though maybe not said directly out loud, ABC, always be curious. Because if I'm showing a genuine interest in you, Kaylee, and what's most important to you, it's no different when we move on to talking about recruiting. I have a question in recruiting that I ask. I say, hey, Kaylee, uh, if you had two automotive selling professional positions lined up at this time at two different dealerships, what would really make one stand out to you over the other? That's a great because question. now I'm really identifying potentially a black swan, aka an underlying piece of information that is driving their decision. And at the end of the day, as a selling professional, whether you're selling cars, I do always say, and Sandy always says, everything's a car deal. Whether you're selling cars or you have a physical or, or non-physical offering, it's, it's just about finding out what, what's most important to your client and, and helping them move towards that desired end result or move away from the loss that they feel they could have without having your product or service. That makes sense. And asking good questions, because it sounds like you guys train on, it's not like there's a set question, amount of questions that you ask. It's almost like having that instinct to, to, to figure out what is driving that consumer or that client. And being, genuine, and being genuinely curious, Kaylee, you yeah. know, like if, if it's coming across as a phony curiosity or someone's loading your lips with word scripts and word tracks all the time, like if somebody talks to me, whatever, at least me, I mean, maybe because I'm seasoned, maybe an everyday individual who isn't out per doing, you know, bigger purchases all the time might not notice, but I can instantly feel when somebody's being disingenuous or asking me questions that sound scripted. I mean, yeah. it, it, and it almost makes you curl up even more, right? Oh yeah. You're like, uh, do you even care? Like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and, and the best thing about what we do is, you know, again, pillar one, creating that, that mindset to move forward in the rest of the pillars of being genuine, authentic and being truly yourself. You know, as I said before, our mission in seven pillars is to gather and share all the information we need to help our clients make the best decision possible for them. I might say that like that naturally, but you might not, you might say it in a completely different way. You might be like, Hey, I'm Kaylee Felio. And Boom, here's my mission in Kaylee's words. Yeah. And a lot of times that builds trust rather quickly. And then when you show that genuine interest in what they're looking for, you know, uh, and, and a lot of times labeling it. So, you know, when somebody tells me uh, a bunch of things about, you know, they want a safer car for their children, they bring their kids to soccer practice. Well, it sounds, it really, well, Kaylee, it really sounds like safety is the utmost priority to you in your next vehicle. Yeah. And yeah, no. that's what I just did. Exactly. <laughs> I labeled, I labeled it to you. It sounds mm -hmm. like it looks like it feels like. So a lot of these different strategies of just communication style, rather than loading people's lips with word tracks, being disingenuous and ultimately going for the close and doing the negotiation thing that everybody honestly hates. Uh, and nobody's buying that anymore in 2023. It feels like they're not. No, it's funny. You have safety. No, that's not what I was thinking when I bought my car. <laughs> what were you thinking? I'm curious. I was thinking fun and off-roading. Oh yeah, what do you you have? Do you have a Bronco? Yeah, I got a Bronco, and so you I was do like, have a Bronco, yep. I'm like, the car seats will fit; it'll be tight, but it's okay. They'll grow up, and they won't have. Crazy. Yeah, eventually they won't have to worry about it. They'll be enjoying it with mom instead of uh, it being an issue at all. So cool, awesome. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yes, I was thinking about safety. I, I should. I mean, the Bronco's yeah. safe. Well, but... The Bronco's safe. You'll be all right. It's funny. Okay, so I want to switch it up because you, you mentioned mindset, and I think mindset has a lot to do with what you also do, which is, which is boxing, right? Which yeah. I'm like, how did I not know this about you? And then, of course, there's like pictures behind you. <laughs> yeah, no, I got some uh, some good ones. That's actually a signed Ring Magazine cover from, have you ever seen the movie Raging Bull, Robert De Niro? No. So check it out sometime. It's an old school boxing flick. It's in black and white, but it's done like oh. that on purpose, but... Uh, yeah. That's Jake LaMotta's signature, who was the Raging Bull, and that, and the, he signed it for me personally. So yeah, but yeah, I got some boxing stuff. But go ahead. So with your question, I'm sorry, I just didn't know if you knew who that was. So no, I, of course I don't know who that is. <laughs> I don't know. I don't assume. I don't know. But I'm I'm the worst at movies. I'm the worst at names. <laughs> Are you? 
Yes, I'm not the person to talk to you about any of that stuff. I'm really good with like people's faces. Like if I saw their face, I'm like, oh yeah, I know who that is. Yeah, maybe yeah. Be, I don't know. All good. <laughs> but okay, so you started boxing when you were 17. That's great. Right? Why did you? Why did like normally when you start boxing, you start boxing when you're like seven. You know, like when you're a kid. What what made you start at 17? So I'm going to tell you a, a pretty wild story, which uh, Sandy will be happy I'm telling you this because he always oh, wants me to. So my father was a drill sergeant in the military, taught uh, uh, Rikondo School at Fort Bragg, ROTC cadets. He trained and taught jump school. He was 82nd Airborne as well and professionally drag race motorcycles, like I mentioned before. Very no-nonsense guy. I grew up in a military kind of household that was non-negotiable all the time. Mm-hmm. It was also one of those households that if somebody picked on you, my dad's an old-school Brooklyn guy from Brooklyn, New York, so kind of paint the picture for that on top of the military. <laughs> yeah. But um, oh. he, he was like, you know, if somebody, if you get into a fight in school and something this is back in the day, you know, our age where that was possible, he's like, hit okay. him back, you know? <laughs> and if you come home and you hit him back, I'm going to want to know why. Uh, but I was such a, if you ask anybody in my family, they would literally tell you, Ron, a boxer. Yeah, right. Because I'm a very mild mannered individual. I'm very relaxed and laid back and I care about helping other people. I'm not a violent person by nature or have some kind of ego driven need to fight other people. It's just not built in me. Um, but when I was 17, I was in high school and I was in, uh, first period, senior year of science class. And I was in that class with a buddy of mine that I grew up with since sixth grade, sixth grade. And I was 103 pounds soaking wet. Like I was very skinny my whole life. Always picked on for it, played football, got ran over the whole nine. Didn't really work for me. So I'm in class and Nate is your stereotypical, and I don't mind name dropping him. We talk still to this day. Nate is your stereotypical uh, at the time. Not great in school, kind of picking on other people because he was a bigger guy, very kind of in a bully-ish way individual. And everybody knew that. And somebody instigated him and told him that I was talking badly about his girlfriend at the time, and which was not true. They were trying to instigate him because they knew it was easy. And first period rolls around. He comes in the classroom. It's like... I'm going to fight you, screw you, you know, all the F-bombs in the world. And I'm like, Nate, I didn't talk about Ashley like that and I because I didn't. And yeah. I went back home to my father and I said, Dad, Nate is trying to fight, fight me. I don't know what to do. He's going to kill me. He's over 200 pounds. I'm 100 pounds. What am I going to do? <laughs> and his father and my father rode bikes together. We grew up in the same neighborhood. And my dad said, Ron, he's a bully and he's bigger than you. So what he's probably going to do is he's going to get up close in your face. And when he gets right here and he goes to shove you and puts his arms to his side, I want you to hit him under the chin and aim for the ceiling. And I went back to school the next day. The, the bell rings. I go to the doorway. Nate's standing in the doorway, stops me. I tried to avoid it. He did exactly what my father said put his hands to the side. I hit him under the chin. I drop him in the doorway of science class. And I look down at him and I'm frozen because holy crap, I just hit my friend. Yeah. At least I thought so. And also I can't believe I knocked him down. Yeah. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. And he's looking up at me like, and my, my science class, professor's crying and I go to help him up. Like crying because laughing or crying because like, oh my God. Scared. scared. Okay. Yeah. And I go to help him up because my heart, like, you know, I was yeah. just like, I just did it so you get away from me. Yeah. And when I go to pick him up, you see the fire light up in his eyes. He throws a giant right hand. We end up rolling into the classroom. He tries to jump on top of me. I turn my shoulders. I catch both his arms under me. He tries to pull his arms out so he can start wailing on me again. And uh, I held on till he got tired. And then he said, if I get off, you promise you won't hit me again. I said, good, just get off me. We go to the principal's office, who was our wrestling coach. I didn't wrestle well at 103 pounds. I was so skinny, but I tried because my dad wanted me to try everything. And, okay. um, but you did have dad, a little bit of like knowledge because you did wrestle. It sounded I, like- but I never boxed. I never been in like yeah. a physical fight. Like, but when you explained like how you held his arms, that that to me sounded like a wrestling style it, thing. It was a little bit, and it was also intuitive because I knew if I landed with my back down. 
he would land on top of me on my chest and sit on me and just yeah. yell on me until I was unconscious probably. <laughs> so yeah. I didn't want that. So anyway, so yeah, it was a little bit intuitive for sure. So we get to the principal's office. Both our fathers come down and this is where the boxing piece comes into play. Okay. My dad says to Nate in front of his father, he says, Nate, if you feel for whatever reason Ron cheap at you or you're just not done with it, I'm going to rent a boxing gym. The two of you can put on headgear and gloves. And you guys can beat the crap out of each other until one of you runs out of gas and gets tired while dad and I have coffee and donuts, but there's going to be no fighting in school moving forward. Understood? Yeah. And he said, my dad said, what do you want to do? He said, I'm good. He looked at me and said, Ron, what do you want to do? I said, I'm good. He goes, all right. So we leave. The minute I get in the car with my father, my dad first goes, good job. (laughs) And then second goes, I'm taking you to a boxing gym. You need to learn how to defend yourself because of this now. Because somebody else could try something, essentially, was his thought. So I go to a boxing gym in Sarahville, New Jersey, and I meet Sal Lopez. Sal Lopez was my first coach and who brought me to win my Golden Glove State Tournament. But he was ranked number two in the world. He fought Hector Camacho for the world title in 1997. And this was my my coach, my mentor in boxing from 17, even through now we still speak, but we don't work directly together coaching wise anymore. But within one year, uh, I entered the Golden Glove State Tournament, which is held by USA Boxing across the country in every state. And I won the state tournament a year after I got into a fist fight and didn't know what to do with my hands. And at at 132 pounds, so I did put on some weight through training. I won Golden Gloves at 132. Uh, in 2012. And then I was runner up in 2015 uh, for Diamond Gloves, another state tournament. So I have um, as an amateur an eight and one record, eight wins, one loss. And then now at 32 years old, all these years later, I'm actually going to go have a pro fight because I just have to do that for myself. But that is how I got into into boxing, essentially. Interesting. Okay. The universe kind of brought it to me more than I decided I was going to be a boxer, you know? I could see that because, yeah, you don't, you, like you said, you're, you're always like a calm, not a fighter type person. And I feel like when you're, I mean, I've never boxed before, which I would like to, that'd be fun. Cause I think you'd get a lot of anger. Out. A lot of anger <laughs> and person, confidence person. and self-defense confidence. Yeah. God forbid anything ever happened. It's great to exactly. know. Exactly. Now I want to do boxing once I'm not pregnant. I think there's a boxing thing here. Good. Hell yeah. <laughs> but okay. So what did I want to ask you? Oh, okay. So I wanted to talk about the Jake Paul, Nate Diaz thing. Sure. Because- I'm not that educated in it. I just know that Jake Paul is the YouTuber guy that yes. is not like official boxer. Is that the right term to use? Yeah, no, he's a, he's a, uh, well, think about it as like WWE in a way, right? But he's actually boxing. You know, he's an enter, yeah. he is an entertainer. He has his yeah. pro boxing license and he's getting wins on his pro boxing license right now. Yeah. But has he, has he fought, I should probably know this before I ask this question, okay. has he fought an actual boxer? He has fought a professional, if I had to rate him on a grade scale, a D plus C minus boxer. Okay, so that's like a low. And and lost. Oh, he did lose. He did lose. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. But I want to talk about the Jake Paul and Nate Diaz specifically because that just happened. So what is your perspective? Because he did win that one. He did win. Uh, what What are like the cons and what are the positives out of that whole thing? So, you know, it's kind of like a a disruption to the boxing world, having this kind of dynamic now enter very similar to the, in ways, disruptions that happen in automotive, right? Like, you know, new things come along, new ideas, new ways of doing things. And we all have to make the adjustments who are used to the legacy things we're doing. So again, another fight, fight world to business world collaboration, right? Um, But, uh, or connection rather. Uh, So my take on it all very, very simply, Kaylee, is it's, it's a bigger picture idea. It's one from a pure boxing fundamentalist mindset. It's horrible for the sport because what's happening is you have somebody that became famous on YouTube and then decided I'm going to start fighting people and then caught, got, gained his attention and kudos to him for his ability to brand himself and gain attention. One of the pluses out of this to take a note on. So as much as people want to rag on him, they also should be taking some notes on Mm -hmm. his ability to gain attention. Yeah. But for the boxers that have been not even me, but the boxers that have been fighting since they're seven and they were, you know, purebred to be a world champion 
that don't get the same spotlight as somebody like a Jake Paul because of his YouTube influence, it hurts the sport in that way. Because those individuals aren't getting the same high level opportunities, let's say, or it is taking away from the, uh, you know, pay per view f- and the dollars and cents for the families and the boxers that are fighting at a high level. Granted, they make a lot of money, but it kind of uh, puts a joke ish on the sport of boxing because they're like, hey, well, can't be that complicated if you know Jake Paul can get in there and start beating up old UFC fighters, you know, so. It has the con, I think, in that way, and some of the more uh, pure boxing fans hate it for that reason. Uh, the The pro side of it, it is it has opened the doors for a lot of celebrities, entertainers, former athletes, retired athletes, individuals with a brand to be able to go and create an event that will gain attention to their brand. So even if they're not a fighter, let's say. Like Logan Paul, Jake's brother. Logan Paul fought Floyd Mayweather, went to the WWE, is now a wrestler. But more importantly, there's eyeballs on him. What did he do with those eyeballs? He created Prime Energy Drink. Oh, I didn't know that. Prime Energy is sold across the country in grocery stores, liquor stores, uh, sporting events now. And that all came from awareness to their brand, Mm -hmm. fighting other boxers, YouTube celebrities, etc. And ultimately, now he's got his brand in front of everybody. He's in the WWE and he has an energy drink. Wow. So, although it's easy for me as a boxing and if I take my boxing mindset to think of one, uh this is horrible for the sport of boxing and everybody who's a pure pugilist and boxer. And two, I would love to fight him. <laughs> And we're about uh we're about fifteen twenty pounds apart, so he'd actually be oh. a little heavier than me. But I don't care. Personally. Are you allowed to if you're that much apart? Not not in a a professional bout, but I could spar him. I've sparred people over two hundred plus pounds plenty of times in my life. Uh, oh, that's but, but you can't yeah. but you can't in a match, right? Like they just yeah. it's it's un it's unsafe. And you even see that if you ever wanted to get a uh, an example of weight classes make a difference, watch mm-hmm. Canelo Alvarez versus Amir Khan. And Canelo uh, dropped like five pounds from 165 to 160. And Amir Khan is really a 147 pound welterweight. And they met at about 157 pounds to fight each other. And you could just see the natural size difference of Canelo and how he's able to develop so much more power and is so much more comfortable at a heavier weight than somebody like Amir Khan. So those Uh weight classes are there for a reason. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I'm not planning on putting 20 pounds on anytime soon so uh, i don't think i'll fight him but that's my real pros and cons to to that kaylee more than anything is like from the pure boxing element the con of that but the pro of that like i'm 31 and there are going to be people that are going to want to watch me fight because i'm 31 and i've won a golden glove when i was you know a teenager and have been boxing for many years being like what's he going to do you know Mm -hmm. and i could create my own part of the reason I named my podcast Great American Underdog, I can create my own Great American Underdog story at 31 years old in the boxing world. And then also just for my own mental, I need to know that I did it uh, piece of it. It's a goal. Yeah, Yeah. it's one of those things on your list. You like want to check it off. But you talked about like the brand awareness and what they've done. And that's where it kind of goes back into business. And what we're talking about is uh, we can learn something from them in the positive way of course right. boxing mind is like this isn't right but that's what happens in auto is like we we get stuck in these like ways and we're like this isn't right but it's a new way <laughs> yeah well think about even like you had a conversation with, with bob gower and and hey bob love you bro uh you know he talks about how having service externally outside the dealership like who's taking those phone calls when you only have two service bdc representatives but how many dealers are very resistant to the idea of like oh i can't see what work they're doing you know they're not in the dealership physically you know but yet they would be helping with a lot of throughput even though externally so that's something that's you know not as normal i guess in the automotive industry for a lot of dealerships but the ones that adopt something like traver connect my god the difference that they experience from a tool yeah. so shout out traver connect but yeah so it's a hundred percent right uh, and uh disruption is continuously coming look at ev vehicles in the automotive industry right i mean granted AI, all that. Mention, oh, oh my god and that's a whole nother can of worms 
Um, Should we do something else? I feel like we, we should rename. About, we could talk about anything in regards to disruption when it comes to AI, EVs, doesn't matter, you know? Well, I think that's a whole nother topic because we're kind of running out of time. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I think, is there anything else that you wanted to add to close up the conversation? Because I feel like there's a lot that people can get from this is that, you know, how to be a better salesperson, not always be closing the mindset, how boxing and in, in this all connects, which is so cool, I think is fascinating. Yeah. And I still can't believe I didn't know that about you. <laughs> so so I'll leave you with these couple notes with the boxing and business piece. One of the things which I told you offline that I use is a phrase called that I say to myself, calm in a state of chaos. And then being, as Joe Dispenza says, relax in your heart and awake in your brain, which is called brain and heart coherence. And then uh, ultimately being just your genuine, authentic self, right? So, uh, you know, a lot of people on social media, why are they posting on social media? Because they want attention and rightfully so, you know, we all, we all want to gain attention, but I just, I just warn against if it's feels like it's disingenuous what you're posting or, uh, not really you posting Mm -hmm. it or, you know, you're, you're taking somebody's ideas and not giving them credit for it, that's when you start kind of tarnishing your brand. So my one, I think the one big takeaway here, which Sandy and I harp on all the time, is just be your genuine, authentic self. You know, don't be anybody else but you. Say things yeah. the way you say it, and uh, you know, people are going to be are, are not just going to buy your product or service, but they buy you as well. And if they feel that you have a genuine, authentic approach with their best interest in mind, aka our goal, help people make the best decision possible for them. And it's not about us and we're relationship minded. That's what, that's what wins in sales. And, and ultimately in the long term, which is what we want to gain is, is lifetime value for our clients and ourselves and our families. And just makes you feel like a better person. Like you're just yeah. being, your, you're just a better person, a better it's human. that way when you don't have to lie or fake. <laughs> Exactly. I do want to bring up the fact that you guys are having another, uh, you call it the leadership retreat, right? Business yeah. purpose. Yeah, it's the um, Business Bourbon Cigars Leadership Retreat. That's right. That's uh, September 12th through the 15th. Oh, okay. So you're going out in September this episode. So yeah. it might work out perfectly. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So uh, give a little bit of shout out to that event and how people can, you know. So, go so and- Business Bourbon Cigars is a leadership event where leaders come together to bring actionable ideas uh, automotive uh, specific. It is going to start branching a little bit out of that, but it is an automotive specific event. Uh, leaders across the automotive industry come together, come up with actionable ideas. You've been there. We do mastermind roundtables, and we really, really work together and collaborate together to be able to take those actionable ideas back to our businesses, our dealerships, our automotive partner businesses, to be able to create a better client experience, employee experience, create innovative new ways of doing business, learn other uh, ideas from other industries that might have an atom bomb effect in yours. If you are a leader in business and you really want to take your business to the next level, you have to be at Business Bourbon Cigars in September. Uh, and the best way to access Business Bourbon Cigars and get yourself a ticket would be either visit Scott Joseph or Sandy Sarami's page. Uh, they will have the link to the registration or I believe it's uh, jnlmarketing.com slash Business Bourbon Cigars. But I can't uh, be quoted directly on that uh, because I don't have the URL on the top of my head exactly verbatim the way it's written and out. We'll include the link in the in the announcement of this. Perfect. I've gone to the event and I, what I think, so I've gone to several events and I think what I loved the most about what you guys do is you create real scenarios and team and make people team up. It's not like you like, you know, how when you're in class, you're like, okay, find a partner. And you're like, you know, like, yeah, oh, no. you're like who, who do I talk to? <laughs> Yeah, you like literally pair people up and make us all talk to each other. And it's not like super salesy environment. It's like we're all working through and our own knowledge together to solve problem. (laughs) And those and those those, uh, tables are done very strategically to bring different minds together at the same time. So that way that that kind of dialogue is facilitated. 
Yeah. And not to mention the fun activities too. Cause it's like, if you're going to go to a retreat, you want to have some fun too. And you guys really set up some fun. Oh, the fun is a huge part of it. And also the other thing too, is like, we all get to commingle and, and again, genuine, authentic, be yourselves. Like, you know, we were throwing at last time we were together, we were throwing axes and, uh, you know, doing some, <laughs> some line dancing and drinking some bourbon from Texas, you know, it was a good time. And, you know, we, we got to see a little bit of, uh, of action. April Sim has pushed John Anderson off the stage. <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> which was very yeah. exciting to see, but love you, April. Love you, John. <laughs> yeah. And that was not planned. <laughs> that was not planned. It was part of the demonstration, but it went just, you know, a little <laughs> bit the wrong direction, but that's all right. We all had a good laugh, but we had fun. And that's the point of me bringing that part up is like, there's relationships built off of that. We can all laugh about those m memories together while we're building business together. So very exciting yeah. to be at business bourbon cigars always. Yeah, it's a great event. So we'll make sure we have the link for that. And yeah, I think that's that's it for today. Awesome. <laughs> thank you so much. Hey, Kaylee, once again, I, I just want to say thank you for having me. It's It's been a pleasure to talk to, talking to you. And I, I look forward to our conversations always. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Parts Edge, the power tool for your parts department. We hope you're leaving feeling motivated, challenged, and inspired 